Please pray with me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us this morning. Fall fresh on our hearing, fall fresh on our doing, fall fresh on our being. Amen. They knew it was coming. Jesus had told his followers that after he left this world, the Spirit of God would come to be with them, would dwell in them as a divine source of wisdom, strength, and peace. According to the book of Acts, Jesus reminded his followers of this, reminded them that the Spirit was coming just before he ascended into heaven. He assured his disciples that the Holy Spirit would empower them to be witnesses for Christ throughout the world. They knew it was coming, but they didn't know when or how it would come. So they all waited together all 120 or so of Jesus' disciples, all sharing a life of prayer and fellowship, all trusting that God's Spirit was on the way. And suddenly, our text tells us, a sound like the rush of a violent wind fills the entire house, fills all of those who are in it, fills them with a power that cannot be explained and that cannot be contained. It spills out onto Jerusalem's busy streets, catches the attention of hundreds of bystanders who all speak different languages, who all come from different places, who are here gathered in Jerusalem as Jews from all over the world for this Jewish holiday of Pentecost. Realizing that the time is now, as this crowd is gathering more and more bewildered, uh, Peter stands up, stands up in front of the growing crowd and somehow miraculously proclaims to all of them so that all can understand that Jesus, who was crucified and resurrected, is their Savior, that Jesus is the presence and power of God on earth, freeing, uniting, and reviving all of God's people. And this presence and power of God, Peter declares, is present with them now in this spirit. The same spirit that we, friends, declare is among us now. The story of Pentecost is the story of where we come from. How we, the church, we, the community of Christ followers, how we got started. It's also the story of where we're going, who God made us to be, what God made us to do by the power of this Spirit. I've read this story dozens of times over the course of my life, but it was only a few years ago that I first observed what I think is uh, one of the most important details of this story and its meaning for us today. I. Uh, I have Dr. Eric Barreto, a biblical scholar at Princeton Seminary, to thank for this observation. Um, This observation has to do with the languages spoken by the disciples once the Spirit descends on them and speaks through them to the bystanders. The observation is this. Notice that the Spirit does not miraculously enable the bystanders to understand the disciples as they speak in their own language as the disciples speak in their own language. That's not the miracle. That's not what's happening here. Rather, the Spirit miraculously enables the disciples to speak in languages that are foreign to them so that the bystanders can understand the disciples in their own language. Did you catch that? Did you notice the difference there between those two things? Right. In other words, the Spirit does not move to erase the diversity of languages present. The Spirit does not come to enforce a single language that belongs to the disciples or that belongs to God. The Spirit does not convert the bystanders out of their cultural heritage. Rather, the Spirit culturally converts the disciples puts words that are foreign to them into their own mouths. 
In so doing, I think, the spirit is preserving and blessing all of the cultural differences roaming Jerusalem's streets. For me, this observation of the text, it's uh, shed a new and almost staggering light on a question that I think most of us have asked at one point or another. The question is this. Wouldn't life be easier if we were all the same? If we all spoke the same language, all held the same values, all lived our lives according to the same norms, wouldn't we then avoid so much of the tension, so much of the conflict, seems to threaten our communities and even our world? If we all shared a common culture, wouldn't we all be better off? First, to, uh, to echo Dr. Barreto, I think it's important as we ask this question, we acknowledge that when we say things like, life would be easier if we were all the same, what we're really saying, or at least part of what we're really saying, is life would be easier if we were all like me. If we're being honest with ourselves, at least, I think something like that is on the back of our minds when we ask these kinds of questions. But that said, I do think uh, this desire for sameness can be driven by admirable impulses, admirable inclinations. For example, many of us are in tune with realities of injustices in our world, realities of racism, sexism, heterosexism, other injustices in our world. And if we were all the same, or at least if the world had consistently regarded and treated all of us as the same, then much of the hatred, fear, violence, injustice in our world wouldn't exist, we think. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Moreover, as Christians, we can point to places in our scriptures that use language of sameness to describe us. For example, the Bible says again and again that we are all adopted children of God. Wouldn't it be fitting, then, for us, for us as Christians, to prioritize our theological sameness and downplay all of the worldly features that differentiate us from our other siblings in Christ? Certainly, there is something desirable about that approach. But ultimately, I think it misses the mark that God has set for us in scripture. Because our adoption as God's children, friends, it doesn't undo our differences. Rather, our adoption as God's children undoes any claim to superiority or inferiority based on those differences. In other words, we are not all meant to be the same. We are all meant to be equal. We are all made to be God's children. We are all declared to be God's children, to be of equal, inestimable worth in the eyes of our Creator and Savior. From God's perspective, then, the differences of language, of culture, of race, of gender, ability, age, sexual orientation, and more, from God's perspective, these aren't problems to be fixed, not trifles to be ignored, not nuisances to be tolerated, but gifts to be celebrated. And God invites each of us to delight in this diversity, a diversity that is at times bewildering, confusing, an incalculable diversity around us. We're invited to delight in it as we work towards God's vision of equality. So how do we do that? Well, for starters, I'd say the story of Pentecost suggests that however we're going to do it, it's going to take us out of our comfort zones. It's going to bring us into contact with things and into communion with people who feel foreign to us. It's going to be confusing and challenging at times. 
Many of you here attended my ordination service um, six months or so ago, and, and those of you who did visited my home church in New York City, Greenwich, in Greenwich Village, uh, Judson Memorial Church. I was reminded as I was preparing for this sermon that just a few months after that celebratory day, my ordination, two of Judson's members, Jean and Robbie, were detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Both men, Jean and Ravi, entered this country legally decades ago. Both of them worked hard to obtain permanent legal status, but strict, rigid immigration laws prevented them from doing so. Ravi was convicted in a rather dubious trial of a, of a wire fraud over 20 years ago, for which he served time. Jean was uh, convicted uh, of cocaine possession over 30 years ago, for which he also served time. Since then, both men have been upstanding and productive residents, running businesses they founded, fully compliant as well with ICE and their regular required check-ins, doing everything that they were asked to do over these decades. Both Jean and Ravi have spouses who are American citizens. Jean is raising three children who are American citizens. Both men have also been active in advocating for immigration reform, which led many insiders to conclude that these two individuals were targeted by New York City's ICE office. Both of them uh, were detained, as I said. Ravi unexpectedly detained during one of his regular check-ins. Jean detained as he was leaving his house, walking to work one morning. Both of them were flown to the same detention center outside of Miami. And on the night just before Martin Luther King Jr. Day, they shared a cell. I was at Judson on Martin Luther King Jr. Day the next morning. I was there for a service, and I was there when we all learned that our friend Jean was being deported to Haiti later that day. Gasps and cries immediately filled the congregation. It was like the rush of a violent wind, I'd say, filling all those who were gathered with grief and anger. And after the service, our energy spilled out onto the streets in a rally on Jean's behalf and on behalf of all undocumented immigrants from whom compassion is routinely withheld. As I saw it that day, this was a Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. I don't know what Pentecost will look like in your life or in the life of this congregation down the road. But I do know that the Spirit is inviting you to honor God's gifts of diversity in the world around you, inviting you to let yourself be confused, to let yourself be challenged by that which seems foreign, and inviting you to grow and delight in hospitality, in generosity, in forgiveness by the power of the Holy Spirit in each of us. Amen. Please join me, friends, in singing our second hymn.